We are speaking today about the resurrection of Jesus, Yeshua, the Savior rising from the dead with, I believe, the world's foremost expert on the resurrection of Jesus, Dr. Gary Habermas. Hey, friends, this is Michael Brown. So glad to be with you. And if you're watching this on YouTube, if you are listening on radio, if you're watching on Facebook, wherever you're picking this up, listening on podcast, I believe you're going to be richly blessed, edified. I'm not going to be taking calls. This is just going to be interaction. I wish I had hundreds of hours to interact with and learn from Dr. Gary Habermas. He's a professor professor at Liberty University. And really, God's raised him up as a scholar, an apologist, and a believer to address the subject of the resurrection of Jesus like, like no one else really in our generation. So, Gary, thanks so much for joining us on The Line of Fire today. I am very glad to be your guest. We've done this before, but it's good to be on with you again. Yeah, and it's it's good to uh, to get your face up on Skype as well for folks who don't, who <laughs> right. don't know you. So, uh, how is it that you you became interested on an academic level on the resurrection of Jesus? Well, you, you know, I, I do a lot of interviews, and I am frequently asked that question, and I tell people, I wished I could sit here and say. Well, you know, Michael, I, I just like to help people, and I'm very altruistic, and I help have everybody else's needs ahead of mine. But that's not the way it started. Um, in my early days of studying the resurrection, I was in the throes of of major doubt. Mm. I I'd been raised in a, in a Christian home, a German Baptist uh, home, and but I I started going through some some drastic doubts and people started saying to me, well, you know, don't lose your faith. Um, try this out, try that out. Look at the reliability of the new Testament. Look at archeology. span You know, we may have found Noah's Ark. Have you ever looked at prophecy? Have you ever looked at, and I started looking at these things. And I just didn't think some of them were decent, but I didn't think any of them closed the circle, so to speak. And then one day I realized that if the resurrection happened, that in principle could answer my questions because it would establish not just the resurrection, but the truth of Christian theism. So I thought to myself, well, that could do it, but I have to know what happened. And that launched me into my study of the resurrection for my personal questions. Now, I would like to think today I do it a lot to help people and deal with doubt with people and everything else. But for me, it wasn't quite that way. Well, you know, in a sense, that's the best answer you could have given because that underscores the reality and importance of this in our practical lives. You know, for me, getting involved in Jewish apologetics and pioneering a lot of that field in our generation was because I had to, because I got hit with all kinds of major questions from the rabbis and counter missionaries, and I didn't have answers for them, and I didn't know anyone that had answers. I knew Jesus had changed my life, but I also knew they had strong questions, and, and I had to follow the truth wherever it led. So often it, it's out of personal crisis that the greatest breakthroughs come in, in many of our lives. So, uh, Gary, am I oversimplifying things to say that ultimately, bottom line, when it comes to our faith, Bible, world religions, everything, our, our personal day-to-day life, that what we ultimately need to know is did Jesus rise from the dead or not? Because if he did, then everything else falls into place. And if he didn't, nothing else makes sense. Uh, yeah, now that in a way that's First Corinthians fifteen twelve through twenty. But at the same time, I think you're exactly right. Uh, often when I take questions, Mike Lacona does this too. You know, Mike was my student, and and we kind of give each other ideas that we use in lectures. And we will frequently, when we're doing Q and A, people will say, "Well, what do you do with the genocide passages in the Old Testament? Or what do you think the time of creation is? Or?" What, what's Old Testament apologetics looks like? What New Testament? Apo- and we'll say to them, just to be sort of smart, Alex, but we want them to think about what we're saying. We'll say, yeah, okay. And I'll be quiet. And they'll go, well, what do you say? And I'll say, well, I really don't have to answer your question. And they'll go, what's going on here? And I'll say, look, trying to get an idea, you know, I'll say, I'll say, yes, but. And and the point is, if Jesus is the definition of the deity in the New Testament, a de- definition of the gospel, if he's the son of God who died on the cross for our sins and was raised from the dead, deity, death, resurrection, 
then all those other questions, they're very tough and they're very important and they all have their own day. But if I know deity, death, resurrection, here's the key, Christianity follows. Mm. If all we know is deity, death, resurrection, Christianity follows. And the fact that InterVarsity and Zondervan have over 50 three, four, and five views books shows you that Christians have a lot of views on a lot of important things. But deity, death, resurrection not only stays firm, it is enough to get us, I like to say, get us on the yellow brick road moving toward the Emerald City. That's that's something for this life, and that's something for the life to come. Now, I, I, I want to set up something very personal and practical, but first, I, I need you to, to let people understand how much academic work you've done this. So just just paint a picture, research, publication. Uh, you know, I'm looking at credentials, distinguished research professor of apologetics and philosophy, chair, Department of Philosophy and Theology, Liberty University. We know that. But uh, I'm asking you to do this for a reason, because I'm going to ask something very personal in a moment. But give us the full view academically. Just boast in the Lord of what you've written, put out, research, what's out there. Well, I'd have to go back and count on uh, for an exact number on all these, but I've done, well, I've I've studied the resurrection, believe it or not, for over 40 years, nonstop. And of my 40-something books, half of them, almost exactly half are on the resurrection. And there's a bunch, that's because some of them are debates, some of them relate the resurrection to theology. One Two relate the resurrection of theology. One relates the resurrection to practice. So uh, 20-some books on the resurrection of the 40-some. Um, I've got in the neighborhood of uh, 80 articles and chapters that I've submitted to other people's books. I haven't counted, but I would bet over half of them are on the resurrection. So that's, that's that many more. And probably 200 journal articles and reviews off the top of my head, and I would say half of them again are on the resurrection. So 40-some books, 80-some chapters, 200 articles and reviews, I would say half of all of that is on the resurrection. All right. So, uh, and again, I'm asking for a reason, because I, I knew that side of you, Gary. I knew the academic work. I knew your the the arguments you've come up with, how people have drawn on your work. Now, Michael Cohn is doing amazing work, a student of, of yours. Yes. What yes. I didn't know was the, the practical side of you until we were at an apologetics conference, and you were speaking on questions like, you know, when God doesn't answer prayer or God and suffering. So I, I, I raise that to say that this issue of the resurrection of Jesus obviously ties in with every area of your life— and is anything but just academic. It started out as a faith issue. You've continued to pursue it on an academic level, but on a practical level, this is something that that plays in with your ministry to others, with your care for others, you know, pastoral concern, believers' daily walk. So how does the resurrection of Jesus, that reality, impact these, forget the genocide questions, forget the Bible contradiction questions, alleged Bible contradictions. What about everyday life? What about the problem of suffering? How does this impact things? Well, in the early 1990s, I've already been into this for decades, and in the early 90s, I started realizing that, that it was all about ministry. And because I get, I have three books on doubt, dealing with doubt. And by the way, two of them are on my website. They're free. I don't sell anything on my website, GaryHabermas.com. Their they're books are free. Uh, but I've had oh, I'll bet you're close to a thousand conversations with doubters. And, and when you hear these people talk, most of the time they are they are incredible pain, mm. incredible personal pain. And it's usually psychologically never as bad as they make out. Um, they're the usual one, loves the Lord deeply, but they're convinced they don't, or at least they question. And please, please, please just talk to me like that. And and so I started realizing in the early 90s that if I could just help these people and, you know, lower their blood pressure or make them relax or let them sleep better, or, I mean, it really affected their lives. And plus, you got a lot of others who want to talk about losing a loved one. My my wife, my wife of my, I'm remarried, but the wife of my four children died of 
stomach cancer in 1995. Mm. So I would talk about a lot of grief cases. Um, a lot of people just have questions and they just bother them to death. So I started realizing that helping people was a great benefit that the Lord allowed me to share with them. So from the 1990s, it's gotten stronger and stronger till today. There is almost nothing stronger on my mind than trying to meet people's needs. So I guess if I could bring the beginning to the end, yeah. it started out as answering my own doubts. It's ended up, I hope, answering other people's doubts and helping them. And, and again, it comes back to that in the midst of the pain. Obviously, this is complex, and sometimes people just need someone to stand there and love them and, and, and hug them. But ultimately, in the midst of death, agony, pain, the resurrection of Jesus, it comes back to that. That's what we need to know, that he rose, and therefore there, there is hope. There's hope beyond the grave. There's light that shines out of darkness. And it's that simple, once again, that there's still hope. If he rose, then there's still hope. Exactly. I mean, Paul, the Apostle Paul says it very, very well in First Thessalonians. He said, we grieve, but not as those without hope. Or you think about Jesus, he, the shortest verse in the Bible, so-called. Jesus wept at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. So even Jesus wept, probably because the sisters, Mary and Martha, were in such grief, and they were such good friends. But he knew he was going to raise them from the dead, just a matter of moments, and he wept. So Paul says, rightly, we grieve— but not as those without hope. And I think about this, you know, there's a lot of difference between grieving with hope, yeah. i.e., I'll see him again, and grieving without hope, it's all over, all good things must end. You know, that's that's a dreary message. And the resurrection, again, makes the difference. Yeah, it, it it is absolute reality. And again, I know you've been candid about your own life, your own losses, but I share all this, friends, because even though I'm speaking with an academic giant in terms of the field of the resurrection and, and so much of the work that he does, I'm speaking with someone with a real pastoral heart. And for many right now, hurting, suffering, and pain, that's going to happen in this life. The longer you live, the longer you're going to see it, including among godly people, Jesus-loving people. The reality that's of the resurrection, friends, the hope of the resurrection carries us through. All right, when, when we come back— I want to talk about why I didn't write about the resurrection until recently. But Dr. Habermas says this about my book, Resurrection. Michael Brown's new book provides an absolutely captivating discussion comparing the recent messianic claims regarding Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson with those of Jesus Christ. Particularly helpful is Brown's approach in identifying and addressing common concerns regarding Jewish conceptions of a Messiah and who not only dies, but rises, providing many fascinating insights along with some sometimes bizarre stories. Highly recommend it. We'll be right back. Thanks, friends, for joining us on The Line of Fire. This is Michael Brown with my special, highly esteemed guest, Professor Dr. Gary Habermas. So, friends, I only wrote a book on resurrection, came out in 2020, uh, res uh, the title Resurrection Investigating a Rabbi from Brooklyn, a Preacher from Galilee, and the Event that Changed the World. I didn't write on it. I didn't focus on it on a major way in my apologetic work with Jewish people until recently. One of the reasons being, well, there's so much good scholarship on it already. And you have Dr. Gary Habermas, and, and you have Dr. Michael Cohen, and, and you have others that have written excellent books, and you know, the old Who Moved the Stone book, the more popular books, and Chuck Colson's conversion and things like that, and how that came about, and the evidence for the resurrection influenced him. So I always thought, okay, people have taken care of that already, and I don't hear from uh, a lot of Jewish counter-missionaries. That's not the big battle, whether Jesus rose or not, for the, for the most part. So I didn't focus on it. And sitting with some young, budding Messianic Jewish apologists in my office a year and a half ago or something, we were talking about it, and it struck me, wait, this is, this is glorious for everybody. This is major for everybody. This is something that I need to emphasize. So, Dr. Habermas, you had followed the events with the death of Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson in 94, at the age of 92, with many of his followers believing that he was the Messiah, and then... Uh, hoping he would rise, or when he didn't rise, coming up with all kinds of different theories. Uh, why did that particular phenomenon catch your interest? Well, because going back uh, 10 years before that, I had encountered uh, 
a skeptic in one of my lectures. Uh, actually, it was a series of debates. And this fellow was telling me that there are rival resurrection claims ab among people who really lived in the old days, people like Sabbatai Savi, um, probably the best known ones are Sabbatai Savi and um, uh, Apollonius of Tyana, one, one, uh, uh, one pagan source, one Jewish source. And I hadn't heard too much about living people who were believed to have been raised from the dead. So I stopped everything. I started reading about uh, Sabbatai Savi. I got a copy of the almost 1,000 page biography published by Princeton University Press. So, yep. you know, you know, good, good book. Another major one published by University of North Carolina Press on uh, Jewish uh, Messiah figures, including Sabbatai Savi. And I went into it in great detail. And it was only after I kind of rested and thought, yeah, well, the two best known people, Apollonius, the two always brought up by skeptics, uh, Apollonius uh, of Tyana and Sabbatai Savi, just doesn't light a candle to resurrection. I mean, they're not on the same page. Nope. So then yeah. when your case came up uh, later with, with Snearson, um, I thought, oh, here's another one. I have to check this out. And it actually... It's it's been here for months, so I didn't do it for this interview. But right to the left of me, about eighteen inches away, is a pile of sources on Snearson. And uh, so when I found out you were doing your book on this subject, I wanted to get something authoritative from a Christian using the resurrection. In other words, everything lined up for me. So I was very happy to see your your uh, manuscript. So Snearson just took his place alongside uh, Savi and and uh, Apollonius of Tyana as alternate cases. And if you're going to do the resurrection, you've just got to be ready for the uh, ancient pagan myths of people who didn't live, then as well as the people who did live, is different varieties of potential uh, mythical or legendary arguments, hence my interest in your work. So, so my, my thesis was that we had an actual study that we could do now we could actually right. compare and say, okay, they, the most devout followers were expecting him to rise. They were, they were keeping vigil at his grave, and yet none of them claimed to have physically seen him after his death. So this was, this was one big issue. Even many claim, well, he's still with us spiritually, or he didn't really die or anything like that. You don't have what we have with the first believers, aggressively preaching the death, 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 death of Jesus. He died. There's no question about it. And then saying they saw him after he rose— you, with all the talk of cognitive dissonance and people are just going to they're going to find something to believe they're going to rationalize this really doesn't happen with mass hallucination of people claiming to have seen someone resurrected right so as much as people want to see it death somehow is very stubborn yeah you, you know and you're right and when i first started looking at the case with uh, rabbi snerson you know i was just impressed when you said swoon some of his followers saying, well, he's not really dead. God's put him in a sleep or he's he's done this or he's done that, but he's not really dead. And I thought about the parallel with Sabbatai Savi, where his his uh, uh, Nathan, the prophet, his forerunner, uh, when he first got the word that that Sabbatai Savi died, he said, no, no, no. God's put him in a in, in a divine sleep, and he's going to be coming back in a short time. He's going to cross the Jordan and come into Israel and set up his kingdom. Of course, of course, problems. Number one, uh, uh, Sabbatai Zvi was dead. Number two, he never came across the Jordan. Number three, in the meantime, Nathan died. So just all kinds of historical problems with those kind of claims. But the similarities in Christians, with Christians, we argue against swoon. But in these two Jewish cases, yep. uh, Sabbatai Savi more, but Snerson is kind of, I, I take it, he's kind of a minority view. But swoon comes up and it's held positively. <laughs> so it's just some odd comparisons. Yes. Yeah, so you have to deny the reality of the death, the ones that still claim he's the Messiah, uh, Rabbi Schneerson. And he was a tremendous Jewish leader, influential, all that, but not the Messiah, obviously. So they, if, if you look at calendars that his most devoted followers print, uh, when you get into June, the month of Tammuz, it doesn't show his death because they don't 
they, they, they have to deny it. So we affirm the death. That's the first big difference. Second, we affirm a physical resurrection. And then, you know, in the early days when the movement was growing after his death and, and people were still hailing him as the Messiah, people were saying, you see, this shows how Christianity grew out of a myth as well. Well, the problem is the movement as a whole has had to distance itself from the claim that he was the Messiah because he didn't rise. And, and, the, and part of the movement is actually splintering over that. So again, the, the, the modern test case that we have in front of our eyes uh, ends up with the opposite result of what you have with the Jesus movement. That's right. That's right. I'm That's sorry. okay. That's all right. That happens with live interviews and stuff. It happens. Yeah. I should have bought, but all I had to remember was to put the thing away before it started, and I didn't do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you're right. I, I just think the interplay of the differences with with swoon versus no swoon, and Christians are adamantly opposed to it, and many Jewish cases, both with, you know, the cases uh, Sabbatai Savi, they trace these uh, letters across the, from the Middle East all the way up to uh, Northern Europe, and there's just a lot of material, and and there's just a lot of difference between celebrating swoon and talking swoon down. So, it, it, you know, when you first get in there and you think, oh, yeah, well, he wasn't really dead like Sabbatai, you think, wow, that's a different kind of claim, you know, for people who like swoon. So, yeah, I, I think those are great cases. And you handle all that in the book and you do a very good job with it. And, and we've needed a treatment like that for a long time. Well, I, hey, knowing since you know the field inside and out, I'm, I'm glad there was a little, a little, little niche we had here that uh, that others didn't. And uh, but an important know, niche, a very important niche, I think. What's the one you're doing? Yeah, I appreciate that uh, very much. What what struck me before this thing happened, when when he had his his uh, serious strokes at the end of his life, Rabbi Schneerson, and right. and then he couldn't speak. And some of his followers actually put out some ads citing Isaiah 53. He's suffering for us. And he's like a lamb going to the slaughter. And I said, I'm telling you what's going to come. I actually wrote it. I just didn't have the wherewithal. It was be the pre-internet days. I didn't have the wherewithal to get literature out, tracks to distribute in Brooklyn where this was taking place. But I said, here's what's going to happen. When he dies, you're going to say his death was the atonement for the sins of the generation. That's a traditional Jewish view that a righteous person dying can pay for the sins of the generation with, with the people's repentance. And then you're going to say he's going to rise from the dead. And, and then I'm going to say, not him, but, but our Messiah, our guy, rose, died and rose for our sins. It, it all unfolded like that. And because he's still so well known, the movement's actually grown after his death. To us, this is a great opportunity to present the rabbi who did rise from the dead. So, Gary, in, in two minutes, how does Jesus stand out from the other ancient pretenders or just, hey, every religion has a dying and rising God myth? I mean, the popular stuff people throw out at you. What makes Jesus' death and resurrection different? Well, you know what? I will first say that uh, in the last year, I think I've done three different articles, not purposely, but I mean, well, I mean, purposely I did it, but I mean, different people coming to me saying, will you write an article on this? Will you write an article on that? And my list has gotten longer for things that set Jesus apart supernaturally. And I started with about four or five, six reasons many years ago, and now I'm up to eight. And I think there are a number of things that make Jesus unique over every major founder of every major religion. For example, of all the major big name persons, uh, you know, Krishna, Buddha, Muhammad, Moses, nobody else claimed to be, no one else took titles of deity. Nobody else. Nobody else said with titles of deity, my death, uh, you know, I'm thinking about Mark 10, 45. I've just come to give my life a ransom for many. Nobody said, I'm going to die for your benefit of, of all these founders. Um, Christianity is the only one with the major founder who said, uh, my death is going to be followed by my resurrection. How about the teaching that Jesus, Eb Yamauchi, retired a uh, history professor, University of Miami of Ohio, an ancient historian and a very good specialist. Ed says that Jesus is the only founder of a major world religion of whom miracles are reported within a generation. So now he's a miracle worker. Mm. Uh, I know this is more iffy, but what do you do with something like the Shroud of Turin? 
Uh, Jesus also, his major teaching was the kingdom of God and how to get there. He's the only founder of a major world religion who, to paraphrase him, even Rudolf Boltmann acknowledged this, uh, uh, an arch skeptic, that Jesus said, what you do with, I'm paraphrasing, but what you do with me determines where you spend eternity. Uh, those are unique. So there's. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in right there. So unique sure. that right at time for the moment, we will be right back with Dr. Gary Habermas. Yes, friends, the great news, the amazing news, the glorious news, the incredible news. To me, the, the only news I ultimately need to know, Jesus, the divine Messiah, died for my sins and rose from the dead. Therefore, hope springs eternal. Therefore, he is Lord. Therefore, everything else falls into place. Michael Brown, delighted to be with you on the line of fire. I'm speaking with my esteemed colleague, Professor Gary Habermas the number one authority on the resurrection of Jesus on the planet today. If anyone wants to dispute that, go ahead. But I think I have a hard time doing that. And Gary, there, there are always going to be people who say, well, I'd like to believe in the resurrection, but it seems like the gospel authors contradict things in such a way. I, can I really trust them? Are they really good witnesses here? Obviously, you've answered this question hundreds or thousands of times, but if you don't mind doing it again, how do you respond to that? Well, I'm going to use the same pattern I did earlier where people say, well, what do you do about genocide? What do you do about creation? What do you do about prophecy? What do you do about anything? And I have two answers to this. The, the, let me give the, the first place answer. The, the primary one is, is this. Depending on how you argue for the resurrection, I, I use what I call the minimal facts argument. I take data that the most critical scholars, the Bart Ehrmans of the world, will, will concede. I take their data and show how the resurrection happened from their data. If you do it that way, my main response to discrepancies, now I think they can be answered. I do think that. But my main response is it's, a, it's an irrelevant point. Now, I can tell you since I've done a head count— from 200, 200 years, over 200 years, from 1800 to present, from Friedrich Schleiermacher, the founding uh, founder of German liberalism, and on through over 200 years, the most common complaint against Christianity is there's discrepancies in the New Testament. Mm. It's very, very common. And the whole thing on the minimal facts argument, if I use their facts, the whole thing is a moot point. It makes no difference because on the minimal facts argument— I want, I want your listeners to take me the right way. You can concede, I don't, but you can concede problems in the New Testament and still get a resurrected resurrection because you're using a source that critics give you that they think is full of errors. And I'm saying, well, I don't think it is, but for your benefit, I still get a resurrection. Then I'll say, okay, time out. If you understand my argument, we got the resurrection down. Now I'll go back and talk about those discrepancies. I don't think they're discrepancies. But but I'm saying more directly, let me just say it again. On the minimal facts argument where you take the data that critics admit and there's still enough of a basis to show that Jesus is raised, the discrepancies are irrelevant. And they're irrelevant because my, the response is, look, hold those things for now. But if I can get there with those things you don't think are discrepancies, then you don't have an argument. You lost your whole basis for an argument. And, and for the sake of the few people on the planet who don't know the minimalist facts argument, could you lay that out for us? Sure. Um, what I did was I actually started my doctoral dissertation way back in the Middle Ages. Um, I finished that thing in 1976. So I was writing on it. Actually, I was writing on it on this years before that. So since about 1970, I see, see once again, I was answering my own doubts. And so I thought to myself, I was going to school and I was being teethed at that time on Rudolf Boltmann, who was the biggest name skeptic, and he was more skeptical than than uh, uh, Bart Ehrman today. But he would only he would say, "I'm only going to give you a few facts," and then I would start asking myself, "How far can I get with Rudolf Boltmann's facts, mm. or how far can I get with the Jesus Seminar facts, John Dominic Crossan? How far can I get?" with Bart Ehrman's facts. And I would I would make lists, uh, and they would give you the list. In their books, they will tell you, I concede the following for good reasons. And I would say, wow, 
Well, you just gave me, in the case of Robert Funk, the co-founder of the Jesus Seminar, he gives me over 20 of them. And I would say, man, you're, this is a joke, but I mean, I would say, wow, to myself, I'd say, wow, you're conservative. 20 facts? I only need 12. Then I would say, no, I don't need 12. I only need six. So I got it down to six. And everybody concedes these six. Everybody, Garrett Ludeman, uh, Bart Ehrman, everybody concedes these six. And I would say, with these six, I have a resurrection. They're your six. So what are you going to do about it? And they go, well, there's discrepancies. And I'd say, you're not really listening, are you? You're raising discrepancies in other areas. I only need six of the 10 or 12 or 20 that you're going to grant me. And I have a resurrection. Yeah, but there's a contradiction between it doesn't matter. Don't you understand? It's like a it's like a police report of two cars. And one guy says the yellow car hit the red car. And everybody else says the red one wasn't red. It was kind of a rust color. I'd say, was there an accident? Yes, there was. We have a police report. So that's how the mineral facts works. We we use the data that on which everybody agrees and you get a resurrection. Now, I want to make this plain. I would come back to every one of those discrepancies, and there are great answers, but that's not my point. My point is, since I'm concentrating on the resurrection, my point is, let's settle on the deity, death, resurrection of Jesus. And if that is true, we can do whatever we want to for right now with the rest of it, but you need to think about the deity, death, resurrection of Jesus. All right, and those those six facts are ones that critics, skeptics— people who question the accuracy of the New Testament, the historicity of the New Testament, the inspiration of the New Testament, they would say, well, there's certain things we agree on historically that kind of minimal things. So you've boiled it down to six, which are what? Well, I'll tell you what, if you if you all can see this, here's a New Testament. When I go to college campuses, I frequently do it this way. Here's the way I actually act it out for them in the front of the room. I'll say, look, On this New Testament right here, let's say this New Testament is fully inspired of God. And I'll say, and there'll be a lot of atheists in the crowd. Actually, increasingly, I'm sponsored by free thinkers groups on campuses. And I'll say, okay, if this is inspired, I realize a lot of you don't believe it, but if this is inspired, is Jesus raised from the dead? And they'll go, well, yeah, if it's inspired. Okay, 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 that's good. That's good. All right, now let's get a different New Testament. This one, same New Testament. But this one is not inspired, but it's very reliable. Is Jesus raised from the dead? And they will very wisely say, it depends on what's reliable and what isn't. Okay, that's good. But let's go to the worst New Testament one. Let's go to the one of Rudolf Bultmann, Bart Ehrman, Garrett Ludeman. What are you going to grant me? Oh, I'm only going to grant you a handful of facts. Ah, well, let me ask you a question. On this skeptical, not inspired, not reliable Bible, is Jesus, New Testament, is Jesus raised from the dead? And of course, they'll say no. They'll go, yes, on this one. Depends on what you have for facts on this one. This one's really not. And then I'll say, here's my lecture theme for tonight. On this Bible, Jesus is raised from the dead. Mm. On your data, Jesus is raised. And if you want to question that, I'll say, I'll stay in this room till the janitors kick us out, and it's your job to come up and tell me why why I am wrong about my facts. Now, the six I would use real briefly that I'm talking scholars now. I'm not talking about guys who say they're scholars and they live with their parents and they've never gone to school yet. And, And I'm not saying you can't be a scholar if you don't have a degree, but you call yourself a scholar. Scholars don't call you that. Bart Ehrman goes off on them for dozens of pages. And I'm not talking about those guys. I'm talking about people with terminal degrees in New Testament or a field related to New Testament, classics, theology, philosophy, history, something that allows you to, according to your training, study this data, and you're going to find almost nobody disagreeing with the following six. Real quickly, Jesus died by crucifixion. Number two, his disciples, and I'm watching my words, Jesus' disciples had experiences that they believed were appearances of the risen Jesus. Bart Ehrman says that's absolutely a fact. He's an atheist New Testament scholar. Thirdly, they proclaimed this event very early. And what is incredible in today's research is skeptics, skeptical specialists, have backed that proclamation up to the same year Jesus was crucified or to just a year or two later. That's skeptics. Mm. So very early. Fourth, 
they were transformed. I don't say they all died for their faith. They were transformed to the point where they were willing to die for their faith. And then fifth and sixth, two skeptics who I think believe, came to believe in Jesus, and that was what their conversion was about, namely James, the brother of Jesus, and the Saul, later the Apostle Paul. Those six facts, whose fiction, belief in resurrection, early proclamation, transformed lives, James and Paul, those six. Got it. Now, scholars often speak of what's called the criterion of embarrassment, that you're trying to discern and determine whether something's accurate or real or not. And you use this criterion, which is that if you're writing about your founders, your leaders, and you're, you're giving very embarrassing stories about them, it's more likely to be true than not, because you're, you're not going to tend to make these kind of stories up. So again, as I get into in my book, Resurrection, you have the contrast, whereas the followers of the Rebbe, the most devoted followers of Rabbi Schneerson, expecting him to rise, waiting for him to rise. It's part of their theology that he's going to rise. And yet still, they don't claim he physically rose and they saw it, versus the New Testament accounts, which are very believable because they make the, the founders, the, the apostles, the early leaders look so bad that, that they questioning, doubting, and fear. So on an academic level, how much weight should we put in this criterion of embarrassment? Actually, uh, of the criteria, which sometimes the list of criteria, uh, I will just New Testament folks, New Testament scholars, borrow these from historians mm -hmm. who have used these things for a long time, these criteria. And embarrassment is good. It's one of the best. And there's a lot of examples in the New Testament, a lot of them. I mean, even Jesus crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the cross? Has, has you know, that, that takes a lot of, that takes a lot of explanation and it's right there in the gospels. But the, the it, it's good. Embarrassment's good. The best ones, the highest ones in evidence are um, an eyewitness testimony. Now, many people don't even mention this one because they don't think we have any in the New Testament. But eyewitness testimony for the resurrection. Number two, early testimony for the resurrection. I already said critics are willing to go back to the same year to at the maximum one to two years later. Uh, thirdly, early eyewitness and multiple attestation. How many different sources do we have for this? And just to use Bart Ehrman as an example, he gives 15 different sources for the crucifixion of Jesus, and uh, four of them are not even in the New Testament. Mm. They're not even uh, they're not even there. And then embarrassment is probably going to be the next one. So if you're going to have 20 of these, you know, embarrassment would probably be in the top five rules you'd use. Got it. All right, friends, I'm speaking with Gary Habermas. Check out his website, GaryHabermas.com. That's H-A-B-E-R-M-A-S dot com. If you haven't ordered my book, Resurrection, Investigating a Rabbi from Brooklyn, a Preacher from Galilee, and the Event that Changed the World, I believe you'll find it eye-opening, fascinating as we open up the Hebrew Scriptures and Jewish traditions and faith building. Go to our website, AskDrBrown.org. Check out the book, Resurrection. We'll be right back. Thanks for joining us on The Line of Fire. This is Michael Brown speaking with Dr. Gary Habermas, Liberty University, distinguished professor there and the foremost scholar on the resurrection of Jesus today. His student and that resurrection scholar himself, Mike Lacona, said this very graciously about my new book, Resurrection. He said, Dr. Michael Brown is the world's premier scholar addressing Jewish objections to Jesus. In this volume, Brown assesses several messianic figures from the past to the present with special attention given to Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who died in 1994 and whose disciples claim he is alive and lives among them to this day with keen scholarly labor and clearly articulated argumentation. Brown answers those claims and effectively demonstrates that Jesus is the Messiah predicted in the scriptures. Uh, Gary, we started the interview by talking about your own faith journey, the struggles you had, concluding that it, it really came down to whether Jesus rose or not, and then the other questions could be easily answered. You've, you've given all these years to academic work, 
And then as the years have gone on, this has then helped you to minister pastorally to many, many other people. On a, on a simple level, many Christians never even worry about the resurrection because they experience Jesus in their own lives. They, they met him, they were changed, you know, the old song, I, you know, he lives, he lives. You know, you ask me how I know he lives, you know, he lives in my heart. And, and that's what happened to me. He changed me. Then I got hit with arguments and how to deal with them. Do you find that in today's climate, uh, skepticism, uh, criticism spreading much more on social media, not just college campuses where you're sitting with, with a non-believing professor who's mocking your faith, but now just the general climate through internet, a lot of objections getting out that, that we have to do a better job of getting our apologetics material out to more people, that, that more and more people are having faith questions on these levels because of the way things are disseminating? I think so. And I think the current political climate could be added where, you know, I just said to my wife, half teasingly, but half seriously the other day, to be a white male Christian is <laughs> three blots against your character. There, there are, as, There's a rising number of groups that like to see the churches shut down, like to see Christians shut up, things off the internet. Uh, let's not get the word out there too much. You guys are a little too vocal. Yeah, yeah, I think it's extremely common. And one last thing, I notice anymore that uh, when I uh, put uh, things up on YouTube for other people and they're taping these things, I'll often realize that the the responses that come in, they're over. They're often over 50 percent, uh, let's say, negative, nasty, not tracking with the data, just making nasty comments. There are a lot of say it the way you want it. But there's a lot of people out there who do not like this message. In fact, by the way, I'll add a quick thing. Uh, Craig Blomberg had a published debate on the resurrection with an atheist scholar. And the atheist in the debate, just recently, the atheist in the debate said, let's get something straight right off the bat. I'm not one of these angry atheists, because a lot of atheists say I'm not angry, but he acknowledges that it's very common. And I think it's a growing phenomenon. Mm. Yeah, I heard Josh McDowell say that objections that he was dealing with with college-age students years ago, he's now dealing with with 12 and 13-year-olds. They're just picking it up on the internet, and they don't have the the ability to process things the way an older student would. And then there's the emotion of it. You know, the, the standard review of the books of like the Christopher Hitchens and others that uh, there is no God and I hate him. Uh, so, you know, the angry atheism and how that has spread and disseminated lies. So as, as you're working this through, you're, you're mentoring PhD students, you're, you're lecturing and, and doing interviews like this just for the average, average public um, if, if they said to you, okay, we, we want to believe this, we're getting bombarded with, with all this, why is it that so many fine scholars, you know, Bert Ehrman's a respected scholar and these others you mentioned, why do so many of these smart scholars have a problem with this? Aren't we kind of sticking our head in the sand when like all the smart people recognize that this is wrong? How, obviously, stupid objection, but how do you respond to that? Well, on on two sides, depending on which angle you're going to go with it. On the one side, it's angled by an increasing number of Christians who pay the price to either be a preacher or a lay level person who knows the data and gives the good stuff on a lay level, or an increasing number of people who are getting PhDs and are speaking more to it with credentials and writing books with good companies, secular and Christian. On the one side, it's doing good scholarship, even for lay people learning the data. Um, on the other side, I think, well, no matter what it is, we're going to have to keep responding to people at both a lay level and at a scholarly level. I just think the more we proclaim it, it's just got to be good stuff. But, you know, this is an exciting time to be alive because there are so many ways to do, you know, two, three, four minute shorts uh, on, on, on interviews like One Minute Apologist, for example. Uh, there's so many ways to do that. There's so many ways to do what you're doing with long uh, broadcasts, which are neat. All of this is needed. And the better it is, the better we're going to reach people. But a, a cognate question is, well, hey, if your arguments are so good, how come they don't convert? 
And, you know, it's kind of a really naive question because most conversion, bottom line, does not happen because there are such good arguments. It happens because people have had an experience with the Lord, as you said yourself earlier. So that's how most people come to the Lord. And so that's how anybody is, you know, the ones who hate it, hate it on an emotional level. So that's what it is. I think they're not ready to come to the Lord because the illustration I use, it'd be like if you're my best friend and I'm introducing you to somebody, and I think if you knew this person, uh, you would be inclined to get married. You've been single for a long time, and I think you should be married. You know, we're good friends. So you see this person, and you date them, and you come back and you say, wow, that person's everything you said you were. That the, the, you said they were, and I and I go, well, can I be your best man? And you go, no, you're missing the point. There's no connection between them being the best possible person to marry and my getting married, and they don't want to get married. And I think trusting Christ is much the same way. It's saying to trust Christ is to say I do to Jesus. It's to, as Peter and uh, John say, it's to walk a mile in his sandals. It, it's following him and people aren't ready to get married. So you could get some good data for it. That doesn't mean you're going to do it. And and that's the easiest answer for why more people aren't coming. Yeah. So it, it's, it's a hard issue. It's a hard condition ultimately. And I've seen with apologetics, it's often pre-evangelism. It gets people willing to think about the message uh, because you present strong evidence. That's the one side. Then the other side which is once you come to faith, you often get bombarded, and we need to have solid answers. So last question for you, Gary, just on a very practical level. Uh, you are a professor at Liberty University. You've been there for years. You've seen tens of thousands of students come through the school, and then hundreds of thousands total have, have uh, taken classes online. What do you see happening with young Christians in America? You're getting a great cross-section there. What do you see that's that's positive? What do you see that concerns you? Well, concerning me, uh, there'll be a lot of things. How many people are unthinkingly being persuaded by the skeptics' vitriol and and you know seething critiques that are almost always ungrounded, but very emotional critiques. The number of people who are being captivated by the emotion—that's one. Uh, second issue those people who are leaving any kind of organized worship. On the other hand, we see signs that this generation, oh, I could also add a third one, this generation also, everybody has a view, but not very many study. According to, that's not a put down, that's according to educational surveys that I've seen. Not a lot of study, but a lot of opinions. Um, but on the other side, People are training more. People are pursuing. And even on a basic level, I understand that this is one of the most religious uh, generations. I understand that it's a generation that wants to help people more than many other generations. So so there's good, there's negative and positive in which we can tap in and avoid one and, you know, try to give the uh, the leg up to the, the positive arguments. Yeah, so so let's let's realistically assess the difficult situation, but then let's recognize there's a lot that's positive that's happening. And you know, Gary, I, I came to faith in seventy one, but from sixty nine to seventy one I was a heavy drug user. So my first rock concert at sixty eight. So I was caught up in the whole uh counterculture revolution and then got saved in the Jesus Revolution. Didn't know that's what was happening, but it was happening around the world at that time. But, you know, the world was, was looking at youth then and saying they're just rebels and they're, they're ungodly and all this. And there was a lot of that taking place, you know, the whole sex, drugs, rock and roll. But at the same time, people were looking for something deeper. They, they knew there had to be more than just the American dream and, and the, the earthly solutions that were being presented and even traditional religious expression. They knew there had to be more. So I think today when we see from the social justice warriors to whatever other causes out there, if we can have spiritual discernment to look behind that, beyond it, and see what's going on, what are people looking for, it comes down to the same thing once again. The gospel is the answer. So thanks for all the research you've done, all the people you've mentored, all the material you put out and being so available for interviews. Uh, we're all indebted on the resurrection end uh, to the work you've done. And uh, look forward to amazing things. These are shaking times, critical times, but times in which 
Jesus will be greatly exalted. So thanks, man, for joining us and for all your hard work. And I look forward to joining you at Liberty one of these days. Hey, well, th thank you, Michael. Thank you for your book. Thank you for all your work, those volumes of uh, material on uh, answering different objections. You've just done a great job, and uh, I'm thankful for you coming to Lord. I remember those... I remember those days in the late 60s and 70s that you're talking about. And, uh, you well, know, well, you know, the uh, saying as, as we're winding out of time, uh, the, the old saying, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. Yeah. So uh, and anyway, friends, uh, go to Gary Habermas dot com. Uh, find out about the great resources that he has there and check out my new book, Resurrection, Investigating a Rabbi from Brooklyn, a Preacher from Galilee, an event that changed the world.